Welcome to another webinar from Feedback Works. In this webinar, we're going to look at designing learning experiences that work. Rob Broughton, organizational psychologist and culture specialist, co founder of Feedback Works, will be chatting to Paul Matthews. Within this topic, they will be covering learning and development, feedback, change, performance reflection, and organizational behavior. Paul has an interesting background. He left the corporate world to try something new. He landed a job as a management trainer and soon started to think of ways to make his work even more effective. He drew on his engineering background, which gave him a different approach to L&D. It led to the writing of three books on L&D and the creation of a successful suite of online tools. 20 years after moving into this area, Paul is a sought after speaker on the international stage, not only for his undoubted knowledge, but also for his engaging story led approach and his desire to make L&D ideas easy to understand. He also runs workshops and does consultancy for many blue chip clients in the UK and beyond. He's a regular speaker in L&D events in the UK and around the world, as well as writing for leading industry magazines and blogs. Let's join Paul and Rob as they discuss feedback experiences at work, starting with what L&D is trying to achieve. John, what is L&D trying to achieve? You know, what's the end output? And by and large, it's going to be behaviour change most of the time, unless it's for compliance reasons. But even if it's for compliance, we want people behaving compliantly. So mm -hmm. how do we focus L&D on what it should be focused on, which is getting people to do things better and differently rather than what L&D typically focuses on, which is, you know, getting them to sit in the seat and, and, and receive some content. So that strikes me as, you know, if I, if I characterize that, you know, one, one is the activity and then the, the other one is the outcome. Um, and for people listening now, you know, that might sound quite obvious, but if the outcome is behavior, what are the implications of that? Like, what does that mean you need to do when you're designing Ellen, you know, designing learning experiences or you know, you're trying to establish um, meaningful L&D? What do you need to do in terms of identifying that outcome? Well, I think the first thing is to be aware that the outcome you're looking for is that behavior change. Mm -hmm. And clearly then the next question is, well, if I want behavior change, what is the behavior that I want to change? In other words, where are we now? What do we want instead? So the first step in an answer to your question is what I would call a behavioral needs analysis or a BNA. Mm. So if you start doing the traditional training needs analysis or learning needs analysis, I think you're starting in the wrong place because the presupposition of those is that you will end up with a learning or training type solution. Whereas if you focus on what behaviors do we want, mm. you're not at that point presupposing that you're gonna be doing any kind of learning initiative, you're saying, what are the behaviors we want? What's the gap between what we've got now and how people, how we want people to behave? And then what are the barriers? What's stopping them from crossing that gap and behaving the way we want them to? Now, there could be all sorts of reasons for that, but lack of knowledge and skills is only a small part of that whole raft of possible reasons. So that's the first step is some basic diagnostics on um, the behaviors you want and then figuring out, well, why aren't we getting the behaviors we want? Now, how can we develop a holistic program to tackle all the things that will uh, allow people to cross that gap? In other words, how do we remove the barriers to their change in behavior, even if they want to? Maybe they can't because there are barriers. Or how do we encourage them to cross the gap? In other words, how do we get them engaged with the, with the desire to cross that gap? So there's all sorts of things we have to think about. And you come back to the question then of how do we deliver behavior change rather than how do we deliver content? Mm -hmm. And then that changes your whole design process completely. Does it require, you know, a, a different skill set? Um, I mean, you're focused on something different, like, you know, to, to listen to you now, uh, you know, I can take a step back and say, well, hang on, that sounds like, you know, organizational change. That's a different bucket to LND. Um, you know, is that just an arbitrary distinction? Is it is it about just focusing on the behaviour? I let me let me rephrase the question. How do you make a start with that? How do you make a start identifying the behaviours that you want and the ones that you don't want? Well, the the, the behavioural needs analysis is usually will come out of some kind of task analysis. Mm -hmm. So you're basically saying this person or that team in that job, these are the tasks that they need to do. 
okay, which of those tasks are they currently doing at an adequate threshold level of, of, of you know, delivery of results and which of the tasks they're not doing well enough? Because if they're doing all of their tasks well enough, then no one's going to notice that there's a problem. Hmm. So there must be something that's telling somebody there's a problem with the way that team or that group or that department is doing something about what they're doing. So what's your evidence that there's a problem in the first place? And then how does that direct you to the tasks they're doing that seem to be done in a substandard way in terms of how well they have to be done in order to execute the organizational strategy? Because if the strategy is getting executed, you're fine. So you start yeah. with that task analysis and say, well, here's this task. And how finally you, you, know, you drill down is going to depend on how much time and energy you want to put into that. But you can come down to quite fine-grained tasks and say, okay, this person has to do this task of, oh, I don't know, filing this bit of paper. What is stopping them from doing that correctly? Mm. Is know? it, a, as you say, is it, is it a question of knowledge and skill? Is it a question of motivation? Um, you know, fundamentally, is that particular task required? That that would be a, a different set of considerations as well. Yeah. Well, you've also got that. So yes, you're quite right that this is more of an organisational development thing in a way, but this little point in L&D delivering stuff it's asked for if this initial diagnostics hasn't been done properly, yeah. because most of the time it'll be delivering stuff that won't solve the problem that people perceive they have. And guess who gets blamed as L&D in that case? Yeah, you know, well, your program didn't work. Well, hang on a minute. Maybe we shouldn't have been delivering that program or a program designed that way if the diagnostics had been done and we knew what behaviours we were trying to encourage and what the barriers to those new behaviours were, then we could have designed a program differently to attack that problem properly rather than, you know, somebody disconnecting the training from that context, mm. which is what typically happens. So one thing I like to do is to, to try to identify, you know, like the, the, the critical ingredients or the foundations of, of things, whether that's maybe an approach to culture or, you know, what we're most interested in our business around, you know, feedback, giving and delivering feedback. So it sounds to me like, you know, this behavioral needs analysis is a, is a cornerstone of meaningful learning and development. Would, is that, um, would you say that's true? I would say that's true because it's, well, it's like, you know, Stephen Kirby said, start with the end in mind. If you don't know what you're trying to get, how can you ever determine, A, whether you got there and B, you know, which direction to even start going in? So you need to have that end outcome. And from an organizational perspective, that's got to be execution of the corporate or organizational strategy. In order for that to happen, people must turn up and do the tasks they've been asked to do. It, at, a, at a level of competency or, you know, at a, at a, at a level that is sufficient for them to, uh, you know, execute that corporate strategy. So mm. that's that's your outcome. And mm. that means they're going to do things in a certain way, which sure. is about behaviours. So with, um, you know, with, with L&D functions, we, we get to, to work and, and interact with quite a few L&D functions. And there's definite um, differences in maturity in L&D functions. So on the one hand, um, you know, I could probably find a, a better descriptor of this, but often they can just be order takers, you know, find us a training in X, you know, they, they might they might get from um, a, a part of the business. And at the other end of the spectrum, they really are sort of empowered to, you know, maybe push back and say, well, actually, what behaviours are, are we are we meant to be changing here? And how does that relate to the strategy and the way that you've actually identified? Mm -hmm. So have you got any sort of tips or guidance for L&D functions about how they can become more empowered is it a is it a question of learning how to do behavioral needs analysis that will empower them um have you got some advice there well i think they certainly need to be able to do that behavioral needs analysis and and some of them do it already to some extent mm. when they are quote unquote aligning their training with the business mm. but they're already at that point assuming they're going to do training and a large uh, number of times when you do that behavioral needs analysis you'll discover that the solution to getting the behaviors you want is is typically not or only a small part of it is delivering some kind of training or learning initiatives. You'll usually find 70 or 80 percent of the reason people aren't performing in the way you want is environmental. It's their surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, now, strictly speaking, that's the local line manager's responsibility to deal with that, not L&D. But of course, the line manager says, 
the people aren't doing what I want them to do, so I better send them off to the training people. So L&D gets dragged into that um, process, whether they like it or not. And if they're going to deliver something that works, they're going to have to do that diagnostics themselves. And hopefully in the process, train the manager alongside them as they're doing it to do it for themselves in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, so yes, they do need to get um, to the point where they can do that sort of task analysis, behavioral needs analysis. It's not difficult. There's some simple tools to do it. I've written about it in, in, in a couple of my books. So it's this isn't kind of rocket science here um and and it's not that any vastly new skill set is required although they do need to adopt a more consultancy-led approach mm -hmm. to what they're doing when they're operating with the business and they need to be saying to the business yeah yeah you know we do training and stuff but we need to sit down and talk this through properly so you get the results you want rather than just as you put it be an order taker and say yes we do training and what do you want and how many, you know, stripes do you want on it? Yeah, indeed. So, Paul, um, what are the implications then if um, L&Z, uh, you know, undertake some of these behavioural needs analysis and, and identify the behaviours, but actually the um, the reason those behaviours aren't happening is, is, is not to do with knowledge and skills or the transfer of those into the workplace. Um, you know, it's environmental, it might be motivational, you know might be disconnect between you know strategy and and and, and execution what what should they do then if, if it's not a, a learning need that's that's the problem well hopefully by then they have been working during that consultative process with the the local line managers with other people um, and so there will be an awareness in the management line that there's a problem outside of knowledge and skills mm -hmm. and learning and development See, really what, you're, what they're doing at that point is they're helping the line managers understand and uncover their real needs, not just what they want. Because the line manager will have said, I want some training, which is why L&D's gotten involved in the first place, um, expecting them to be an order taker. And L&D, if it goes back and, and helps them uncover their real needs and not just what they want, then the line manager going, oh, I need to do something about this motivation. I need to do something about this process. I need to do something about the IT system. I need to do something about whatever it is in the environment that is systemic, as you put it. Um, and so hopefully that then the buck starts to move across to the other desk. In fact, uh, L&D should never accept responsibility for poor performance anyway. That's the manager's responsibility. l and is there to help. Whereas, of course, the managers want to try and use some kind of Teflon desk policy and get rid of that responsibility. Sure. Um, so that's really what they need to be doing is shunting that responsibility or accountability back into the line manager's lap where it should have been all along. And, of course, that line manager then needs to bring in the other parts of the organisation with and, you know, with the help of L&D because they've now got, a, if you like, an audit trail of why they think somebody, someone else needs to get involved. So if IT needs to get involved because the IT provision is what's stopping people doing what they need to do, okay, bring in the, the CIO and, and, and start working with that department to, to deal with what's going on. But you've got to go to that 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 person of responsibility in another area with if you like a business case for them to get involved so that's what that consultative process can uh, deliver out the other end is the business cases for the other things and mm -hmm. you'll end up then doing a brainstorm with those different people saying well what do we need to do and it's almost certain that there will be some need for new knowledge and skills but it might be quite small in the grand scheme of things in order to fix the, you know, extant problem. Uh, in which case, whoever's going to program manage the program is unlikely to be L&D. Mm -hmm. It might be IT, it might be logistics, it might be R&D, it might be whoever it is. But L&D will probably have a minor role in that. Or if it transpires that it really is a significant knowledge and skills issue, then L&D would program management but also need help from other departments to deal with the the little barriers that are there sure sure so you know re reflecting on what you're saying there you know it strikes me that if l d professionals are you know are doing their job then they're actually all about performance so and, and it might you know it sound obvious for, to somebody like you but understanding you know kind of human performance individually or, or within a team is 
certainly something in in my career um relatively poorly done it's easier at the individual level than it is at the team level and it's usually easier at the team level than it is at the organizational level to really say this is what performance means for this person or this role or this function um and in the work that we do which is identifying you know often systemic issues across organizations or or maybe more localized issues you know in a particular area um we're often talking about the potential link between these behaviours or practices and performance, but it's quite rare, I think, um, in many industries for managers and even leaders to have a really good grasp of what performance means and what the ingredients for performance are. Um, so I don't know if that resonates with you know kind of what you're talking about, but if I'm trying to identify what the core behaviours are that I want. I really, you know, by definition, have to have a view on how those behaviours constitute the performance I want. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, the the issue is that performance is what's called a nominalization from a linguistics perspective. Yeah. And what I mean by that, it's a verb that's been turned into a noun. Yeah, absolutely. You can't put performance in a wheelbarrow. It's not a thing. No. Um, and performance only happens when people are performing. Yeah. So what you've got to do is actually turn it back into a verb. And if you say, well, we haven't got the performance we want, you can say, how are people not performing in the way we want them to perform in it's order funny. to get the performance? And, yeah, it's, it's, and that once you've got it as a verb, it's transient, it's moving, it's changing, it's going up and down, and suddenly it's malleable. The issue when you use that word performance is it's a fixed thing that people then are unsure how to grapple with. I think uh, it's interesting that you frame it that way because the same thing um, I think has happened with engagement, the same thing has happened with, with motivation because you can't pick those up in a wheelbarrow either. Absolutely correct. Um, they, need, yes. they need to move away from where they are back into a, a transient verb, mm. back into how are we engaging people or how are we motivating people. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of perspective on that. It's and and it, the same applies to things like the word relationship. Yeah. How are we relating? There are so many nominalizations, and we get really messed up when we look at them as a fixed, solid thing that, in effect, almost can't be changed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, and and that's the problem with them. Whereas, as soon as we turn them back into the fact that someone's doing something over a period of time, then we say, "Oh, we can change that." Now we have a chance to actually tackle this and change what they're doing over a period of time. And therefore we're gonna get different results. Mm. Um, so, so that, but of course, in order to do that, you need to loop back and saying, well, have we, have we pulled some levers? Have we made some change? That's getting us further and closer towards what we want, which means you need some kind of feedback loop in place to understand, well, are we making progress in the right direction or not? Mm. Um, so that's always another critical part of, of, of change. Is that well, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned it because uh, it's obviously uh, one of my favourite words and uh, I, I was going to uh, guide our conversation there anyway. So the ground that we've covered, we're talking about maybe some of the critical ingredients or you know foundations of, of a, 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 a good approach to learning and <clears> development. Um, you've mentioned behavioural needs analysis and we've spoken about you know how that relates to people performing. Um, and so feedback, um, you know, let's let's dig into feedback a bit. At a high level, what role does feedback play in, in learning? Well, the one I just mentioned really is understanding whether you're making progress towards what you want. So the first thing is knowing what you want, which is, comes out of that behavioral needs analysis. Mm -hmm. And then you have to say, well, how do we deliver behaviors to people? And of course, there's gonna be a variety of things that people need to do over a period of time to get some kind of embedded and sustainable behavior change, whatever that is that you're seeking. Um, so inevitably, you're talking about a program taking place over time. Now, clearly, if you've got something running over time, you've got a number of opportunities along that time period to start getting an idea of, are we making progress in the right direction? And so that's kind of that feedback. It's, it's measuring along the way. Um, now, at an individual level, of course, uh, it's important when someone's practicing a new skill, a new way of doing something, that they get some kind of feedback on whether they're making progress. Um, and so there's that feedback at an individual level, plus, of course, there's the need for feedback at a more team or organizational level. Um, so, yeah. But, uh, but still, of course, the whole thing is 
given that feedback, how can I improve the way that we are in effect, quote, unquote, delivering behaviors to people? Mm. So the whole thing has to come back to these are the behaviors we want. Now, how do we deliver those behaviors? Which means you've got to start thinking about how do people change their behavior? And how can we get them doing a number of things over a period of time that will generate the behavior change that we want in them? Um, and of course, part of that is is practice. And in order to practice well, you need feedback on whether what you're practicing is is making any difference in your world. From your um, experience, are there any um, kind of feedback practices or you know principles with feedback that that people should keep in mind, or you know, by contrast, anything that people should avoid in relation to feedback? Well, I, I, feedback to me is just information. I take quite a high level view of it. Mm -hmm. It's just information in response to something happening. Um, uh, people often get quite focused on, well, feedback is when a colleague tells me X, Y, Z. Well, yes, that's feedback, but there's far more than that. So it's information from company statistics, company measures. It's, 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 it's information from the accounts. It's information from the share price. It's information from a colleague, yes. It's also information from a stopwatch if you're trying to do something within a certain period of time. It's information from an IT system on, well, how many people did I manage to enter on the system in the last half hour? You know, mm -hmm. so feedback takes a whole variety of forms um, and it's just inbound information that has been triggered as a result of some kind of action. Mm -hmm. So what did what happened as a result of that action? That's just feedback. Um, so for me, it's just information. Feedback, to some extent, is a, it limits people's thinking about it, in my view. Okay. What would be your um, perspective on that then? Is it more about, well, you know, what's the relevance of that information to what I'm trying to achieve? The relevance to the behavior or have you got a... Well, yeah, it's, it's relevance. Absolutely. Now, I'm trying to get to this point. I need some information to help me understand whether I'm making progress in the right direction. That information, wherever I get it from, is feedback to me that's relevant to my journey. Now, of course, I might be on several multiple journeys all at the same time, trying to achieve a number of different things, and that's fine. Um, so feedback will come from different places. But for me, it's inbound information that helps me take the next step, helps me reflect, helps me make a decision, helps me decide where to go from here. Do I turn left or right, and so on. In your experience, are there any things that um, can really help people, you know, use the feedback more effectively? Um, are there differences by personality or, you know, context? Is there anything that we can do to really help people, you know, absorb and act on that feedback? Well, feedback, I think, if you think of it as inbound information, will need some level of reflection in order for people to understand what to do with it. Do I ignore it? Do I accept it? Do I use it? You know, do I seek more? Do I try and validate it? And so on. So I think it's that reflective process is something that some people do more naturally than others. Um, those that don't, uh, it's worth encouraging them and trying to teach them how to do that better. But reflection is a pretty fundamental part of learning and of change. And you could almost say without reflection, learning and change doesn't happen. But of course, we all reflect automatically to some extent, which is why we can even change in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, if you try a different route to drive to work, you're going to reflect on whether that was better or not. Now, you might not consider that reflection, but it is. Mm -hmm. So we're always doing it all the time. It's a natural part of the human condition. Um, but like many things, we can improve the way we do it when we learn a bit more about how we do it and how it can be useful. If we're going to learn about how we reflect, is that um, you know something that we we all need to find our own way of doing, or uh, you know, it, have you got some guidance or, or tips or an approach to help people you know reflect more, reflect better, yeah. understand how they reflect, understand the reflective process? Um, yeah, there was a model I built years ago. Not didn't create it from scratch. It's built on other models, like many are. But I talked about what I called a learning stack. Um, where I made the, the bold statement that learning doesn't happen without reflection. And I, I said that off the, the conference stage for many years and no one ever came up to me afterwards and said, that's rubbish. So I, <laughs> I kind of think it might well be true because um, I'm not an academic researcher, I, but I, I kind of look at what makes sense to me. Um, 
and then try it on for size. And if learning doesn't happen without reflection, my automatic response to that, well, is if we can manage or manipulate or help the quality and quantity of reflection, can we therefore help the quality and quantity of learning? And I think the answer is yes. I came up with a five level model, which very simply means that at level one, I call it unconscious reflection, which mm. sounds like an oxymoron. But if you think about it, if you keep practicing or keep doing something regularly, you will end up with some kind of change in the way you do it, like tying your shoelace or practicing a chord on the piano or whatever. And it's not that you have in your mind, I need to do it this specific way. You just keep doing it. And there's an automatic targeting mechanism in your head, which will lead you towards what you perceive almost at an unconscious level is the best way to do it. Level two is where that becomes conscious and you actually start thinking to yourself, well, what just happened? Who does that better? Why did I do that? How can I do it better next time? And so on. So that kind of almost internal conscious reflection, which is what we normally think of as reflection. The third level is where it's externalized. So this is where someone journals it or puts it in a diary or talks to the dog on a walk or talks to the lamppost the dog is using on the walk, you know, whatever. But it's but in order to externalize it, it has to kick in a whole lot of different neural connections, which, which is why I see it as a different level. You have to think about it a bit differently in order to get it out there in language that's understandable to the external world. And you may talk to a colleague um, at the next desk. The fourth level is where you're going to be talking to a manager or a coach or someone, or you're writing it on a blog where someone else is going to possibly make a judgment about what you are saying. Mm. And so therefore, well, I'm going to think twice before I say that to my manager. That's another level of reflection where you, you rethink it and go through it to check it for, you know, um, congruence and holes and things like that. The fifth mm. level, uh, you've probably heard the adage, the best way to learn something is to teach it. And actually, I don't believe that's totally true. Um, I like throwing rocks in a pond and watching the ripples. The best way to learn something is to prepare the lesson plan to teach it. Because that's when you're thinking about what you're going to, at the topic and what you're going to do. The delivery of that lesson plan is far less important than preparing it. And so preparing a lesson plan to go through content that you know well in order to deliver it to someone who's not seen it before means you have to rethink it in a whole different way for a newbie on the, uh, into the topic. And, mm -hmm. and that's a very, very powerful way. So whatever you're doing in terms of a learning intervention, you can look at the level of reflection you might engender or encourage by the way you're delivering that learning intervention. Mm -hmm. And the higher up those levels you can go, the more likely you are to get retention and, and memory and hopefully some action coming out the other end. It's a really interesting um, framework, Paul, and you know the, it's it's so intuitive. And as you were talking through that, you know, I was relating my own experience to that. And um, you know, the the adage of if you want to learn something, teach it. You know, I was a, an advocate for that. But listening to you, you know, you're dead right. It is the preparation. That's when I think about you know the you know many things I've prepared to teach and to train people and it's the preparation which is the key step in terms of you know making the change within me um, so I wanted to just stick with reflection for a bit because an observation I have um, increasingly over the years is that there's very little space for reflection for people you know particularly in really fast-paced organizations um, it's true there's as much time now as there was X years ago in the day but um, it's easier, I think, for that time to get filled up with stuff, whether that's a, you know, a, a meeting culture in one organisation or, or an always on culture. It, you know, it requires both an individual pushback against that and, and hopefully in, in healthy organisations, a collective pushback to protect that time, you know, for reflection. Um, and I see this as really one of the challenges of our time, you know, where how can organisations and how can people demarcate some time for reflective practice and and for all of the benefits that comes from so so how can organizations do that what is required to actually start to realize the the value of that reflective space and and to protect it well i think that's a cultural thing there's an organization actually i spoke with one of their senior lnd people just yesterday and they use the term protected time for training okay. and yeah. development within the organization they actually use that term um, and it's a fee-earning service organization. So clearly, if someone's 
in a protected time, they're not earning fees. So there's a considerable cost to the organization, but it's still protected. And so within that culture, there's a very definite idea that people must have protected time away from being, you know, um, the whip cracking to earn fees. Um, that protected time is protected. Um, so I think it's more of a cultural thing. And it's it's like, um, I don't know, appraisal meetings. If they keep getting put off because, oh, there's some other thing that's more important, then they get devalued. If protected time keeps getting put off because there's some other more important thing, it gets devalued. So it's it's purely a cultural thing that. Um, while they're in that protected time, obviously you must serve them with things, methods, tools, tips, help to help them use it effectively because protected time that's not used effectively is just as much of a waste. Um, but the first step is to make sure it's protected and that requires some senior sponsorship within the organization and probably over a period of time so that someone sitting at their desk with their feet up staring at the ceiling is considered to be working. Mm -hmm. And that's unusual, um, you know, so. Are there any implications for that, you know, in the, um, you know, in the, in the world we're in today where, you know, there's been a real acceleration through the pandemic into, you know, hybrid working, people working remotely. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of one organisation that we work with who <clears throat> has had a fundamental change in, in all of their uh, employees, you know, moving to hybrid work. They've, you know, they've had to roll out new contracts to everybody and just completely redesign the way that they work. Um, uh, they might be at one end of a spectrum. Another end of a, a spectrum is, you know, organisations that want to bring everybody back so they can, you know, kind of be seen and, you know, a belief that um, if people aren't together, they're not being productive or if they're not, you know, close to hand, um, they're not being productive. Um, you know, uh, do you have any tips or tricks in terms of how to, to manage this this idea of protected time in those different contexts? Not really. I, that's going to depend on the culture, where it is now, and what needs to change within that culture. And it's an attitudinal change. Mm. And it will come back to stories. And it's not going to happen overnight, just because somebody says, even from an edict from on high, says, thou shalt have protected time. It, it won't be honoured until it's really embedded. And that will take some time. That's quite a cultural shift, and more so in some organisations than others. Mm. Uh, so it very much depends on the leadership within the organization, it, it's going to be down to them. And I and I mean, they need to espouse the fact that protected time is a thing. Mm -hmm. But also what they need to be saying is, we need to change as an organization. This is my vision. This is where we're going. We're going over there <clears throat> and do that in such a way that people want to climb on board that train and follow the leader. And the leader can say, well, in order for you to do that, there's some things you're going to have to learn. There's some things you're going to have to get good at. If you want to come on board, and I really want you to, here's what you need to do to, to buy the ticket to get on the train. Mm. And one of the tickets you've got to buy is that protected time. In other words, you're going to have to take some time, as Stephen Covey says, to sharpen the saw. And, and so that needs to be inherent within the culture is that sharpening saw aspect of, of protected time. Mm. Interesting. And then people might well step up and say, I understand that. So it's got to be, for them, it's got to be a believable way to get the change they want to see to follow the leader on the journey they're going on. Yeah, they have to be able to put, you know, two and two together and, and see four and then realise that actually, Absolutely. not only can I, can I see that as being a meaningful thing to do, I'm actually, you know, empowered to do that. I have the permission to do that. And, and, I, and I think, you know, reflecting on, you know, many of the, the leaders I've worked with, one of the changes that, that needs to happen within them is, is it a knowledge component or a skill component, or as you say, an attitudinal component to, to take those first steps to protect the time, the, you know, the first time, and then realize the benefits that can come from that. And actually, you don't have to you know, respond to X, Y, and Z right now. It can wait you know, some period of time to get out of that reflexive pattern of you know, always responding to things you know, that, are, that are right there in front of you. Well, it's the old classic urgent versus important, you know, yeah, quadrants, indeed. you know, this, uh, we all know that, but it's weird how we tend to ignore it. Well, I think when everything's urgent, it's it just becomes that much more difficult, doesn't it? Um, yeah. So I guess uh, just one other area I would like to to ask for your thoughts on um, and your reflections on is, is um, 
learning, uh, you know, learning in the hybrid workplace, um, what we're seeing is so many uh, organisations moving to, you know, self-paced e-learning. Um, and you can understand, you know, in the last sort of 18 months for organisations who still want to focus on some development, maybe they didn't know what else to do, they had that available. Um, but, you know, the, the outcomes that come from that, do you have any tips or guidance in terms of, you know, organisations that might be doing a lot of that? Um, you know, what are some of the costs of that? And, and what are some of the things they could do to, to start to improve, you know, some of the educational and learning outcomes that come from that? I think what they will find is that there will be a widening gap in their workforce between those who have a growth mindset and will follow self-paced e-learning and engage with it and want to improve um, and those who won't. And of course, the whole spectrum and, you know, in between. Um, it's, it's, it's really important to take, this is Carol Dweck's work on fixed or growth mindset I'm referring to here. Sure. Yeah. So it, and one of the ways to deal with that is to move into what I term a learning workflow. And what I mean by that is in order for someone to change their behavior, they're going to have to do a number of things. Along the way, they will need to consume some content, perhaps some e-learning or whatever that is. <clears throat> but just consuming some e-learning is not sufficient to get that behavior change. They have to then go and put it into practice. So we're talking here about learning transfer. Mm. We're talking about taking knowledge gained in some kind of formal or semi-formal setting like e-learning or even a virtual classroom or whatever it is and bringing it into some kind of operationalized way into the workflow so it then becomes useful in the workflow and improves the execute, execution of the strategy. So it's kind of back to where we started from. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in order for that person to go through all the little things they need to go through, um, what you've got to do is kind of almost task them over a period of time with a number of tasks to say, well, do this, look at this bit of e-learning, go and try this out, sit in the corner and reflect on this, practice this, get some feedback from this colleague, talk to John over in that department, and then go back and practice it again, and then try it for a third time, go and talk to your line manager. So it's all these little tasks that have to happen over a period of time. And by definition, a sequence of tasks over a period of time with a defined outcome is a workflow. Sure. So I'm starting to talk much more now about the whole concept of a learning workflow rather than a, a, rather than a, a, a learning event. So people talk about training or learning must be a program, must be spread over time. But the only way that really works is if you turn it into a learning workflow. In other words, a sequence of act pre-designed activities, orchestrated activities that will deliver the behavior change you're trying to deliver and do it reliably, provided the workflow itself has been designed well and obviously provided someone follows the workflow step by step as they go through it. So, and, and that's learning and development's job is to figure out the endpoint, the behavior, figure out the learning workflow that will get people reliably from where they are to that endpoint of that new behavior and then develop and design the workflow. You, you, another way to think about that is, is the sat-nav. If you put Edinburgh into your sat-nav, you'll get to Edinburgh, provided you follow the instructions. But of course, what's happened there is the AI at Google or wherever has determined the, the turn-by-turn -turn instructions you need to do to follow. So the workflow has been designed by the AI system at Google to get you to Edinburgh. And it will adjust that along the way a little bit if required for roadworks or, or, you know, road closures or turns and things. Now, provided you follow the instructions, you will get to Edinburgh. In fact, you don't really have a choice. You're going to get there. There's, there's no way you can not get to Edinburgh if you follow the instructions. Um, so that's what we're really talking about here is a set of turn-by-turn -turn instructions for the employee to go through to take them from where they are to the behavior we want, to that end destination of the behaviors that are desired. So then learning and development has to get real good, A, at determining the endpoint and what that is and defining it in a way that's measurable. In other words, what will we see when those behaviours are there at a threshold level and sufficient to execute the strategy? And what are we seeing now? What's the gap? So there's our measure of success. Um, if you want to talk about it at that level, it's a Kirkpatrick level three thing where you're looking about behaviour change, the delta in behaviours. And then what we're going to do is say, what is the sequence of activities we must design in order to get someone from point A to point B? And how long might that take the average person to get there? 
So you might look at people who've already done that journey and say, well, how do they do it? What, you know, so on. So there's all sorts of ways you might approach that design process, but you are, you've got to design a learning workflow. If you want behavior change, you've got to design a learning workflow. There's no other way to get that behavioral change result. So you're into that whole concept of a learning workflow. And then as soon as you do that, of course, you, you're saying, well, hang on a minute. I've got 20 activities or 50 activities spread over three months for a thousand learners. How the hell do I manage that? And that's when you got to start talking about a digital platform to scale that. Um, and, you know, without putting too fine a point on it, it's one of the things we've built as a learning workflow platform um, so that you can scale that whole idea. But you can put in place learning workflows, um, you know, manually if you want to. It's just scaling them gets difficult. But you're not going to get behavior change without, in effect, putting in a learning workflow. Um, and when you do get behavior change, what's probably happened is a learning workflow has taken place almost without your input. It's just mm -hmm. kind of happened because the learner has sort of done it for themselves or their manager has helped them, you know. It, it strikes me um, a couple of things there, Paul. One is, um, you know, the, the engineering uh, perspective that you mentioned earlier is, is, is so evident to me there in terms of the systematic, you know, way that you've looked at this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, in our discussion, covered you know, some of the cornerstones around, you know, the, the behavioral needs analysis, you've got to begin with the end in mind. Um, you know, you've got to understand that the, the separate tasks involved and how they relate to each other. And the fact that this happens across time and the, you know, the role of feedback, um, you know, in, in those mm -hmm. learning workflows to allow people to understand where they are and, and, you know, course correct. And, you know, as you put it, sort of end, you know, end up in, end up in Edinburgh. Um, so that's been really um, interesting. Um, I'd love to, to have you back. Um, perhaps what we could do in our next conversation is demonstrate to people how you can take these learning workflows online in, in a platform and, and, and you know, we could showcase um, you know, your platform, which uh, um, I'm actually using at the moment as part of uh, some education I'm doing and there's, there's just nothing like it. So I'd really like to, to, to give our audience a view of that. Um, but really outside of that, just, you know, thank you so much for your time. It's been really interesting to hear, um, you know, your thoughts and experience. And uh, I really look forward to catching up with you again. Yeah, it'd be great because there's quite a few little things about designing a learning workflow that are new to L&D people typically because they've not done it before. So there's some kind of there's a lot of stuff the same, but there's some stuff that's different they need to be aware of. So Absolutely. And, and you know, I think at least when I see the amount of um, time and effort that, that is being put into, you know, directing people into e-learning and really missing out on all of those other things, um, then, you know, organisations are really, you know, they're, they're not only wasting money, but they're not going to get where they need to get to. And I think they can do and they can do quite easily, particularly with, you know, platforms such as yours. So um, I'll look forward to that next conversation. Sounds good. Brilliant. Been fun. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Cheers. All right. All the best then. Thank you.